All righty. Howdy, gang. Welcome back to Calc 1. Uh, let me go ahead and get my document camera stuff moving, and we can start working. So last time, uh, I'll summarize what we went over last time. Last time, we met the power rule, which is uh, our best friend when it comes to calculating derivatives of polynomials and other power functions. Two three one one dot o o two. Today is a lecture, and it's the what's the twenty seventh, right? Yeah. Okay, see fuck. One twenty seven twenty one. Okay. Uh, so last time uh, we proved the power rule. I don't know if it's just me, but I cannot see what you're writing right now. Um, oh, maybe maybe it's not just you. Let me turn off the screen share and turn it back on here. Let's see what we got. Here, is this better? Yes, okay. thank yes. you. Okay, good, good. Sometimes Zoom a little flaky. So last time, we proved the power rule, which is section 3.1. <clears throat> Today, um, we're going to talk about more 3.1 stuff. Um, combinations of derivatives uh, and derivatives of exponential functions. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about notation. In fact, I think I'd like to start with the top on notation. Um, we might have talked a little bit about the notation um, last time, but I, I just want to make sure that we're really comfy with everything here. Um, so the power rule said, well, let's start. Let's start with notation. So we've been using, uh, we've been writing f primed of x for the derivative of f of x. Other notations for this exist. Um, so f primed of x the derivative of the function f of x can also be written as df dx or ddx of f of x, like this. Uh, and different, different things have different advantages. Later in Calc 3, you're going to see some pretty crazy shit like curly d x of f. And then in differential equations, you might see something like this. Um, <clears throat> all of them have different meanings. The two on the right here, you don't need to worry about at all. Um, but these, these are pretty important. So this is my favorite notation, the prime notation. It's some concise, simple, um, gets the point across. But these guys also have their own meaning. Um, particularly, I want to talk about the difference between df dx and ddx of f of x. So we think of d dx, this is um, a differential operator. And when you apply the operator d dx to some stuff, you get out the derivative of that stuff. So you should think of this as like a command. This is called a differential operator. And it tells you to do something. It tells you to differentiate uh, 
what's next to it. Um, I tell people that this is a verb. That's a little bit of a stretch. Um, it's not really a verb, but that's one nice way to think of it. Uh, the notation df dx, um, this is straight up the derivative of of the function f of x. Um, it's a noun. It's just a derivative. Right, it's, it's equal to f primed of x. Um, noun. So people get confused between the d dx and df dx. You'll also see like dy dx, right? Uh, and you may remember when we talked about the delta notation, delta y over delta x or delta x over delta t. Um, the d's are kind of like the limiting cases of the deltas, right? If you think of an infinitely small delta, that is a d here. And the term is differential. dx is a differential. df is a differential. Um, and those are fairly complicated things that we will talk about a little bit down the road, but for the most part is, is left for like a 6,000 level graduate class in differential geometry if you want to really understand differential forms. Um, the things for this class that I really want you guys to know is that dy dx, df dx, if you see a ratio like this, where the top is d something and the bottom is d something, in particular, if you got something upstairs next to the first d, then this thing is, is a noun. It's just an object. It's the derivative, we read this as the derivative of f done with respect to x. And it means the exact same thing as f primed of x. If you see just d dx, right, just d over dx with nothing next to the first d upstairs, that is an operator. And it says, you're, I'm going to differentiate whatever you put next to me. So if you want to make that a noun, if you want to say, you know, this is a derivative rather than a differential operator, you got to tell me what you're differentiating, right? You got to put something next to it. So this says, I'm going to differentiate this thing, f of x. Um, with respect to this variable, right, x. Uh, and that's, that's the main difference here. So this is a, think of this as like the prime. Think of the ddx here on its own as being the prime here on its own. It's not f primed, it's not g primed, it's just the prime. So ddx is just the prime and df dx is f primed. The notation is useful, especially when talking about the way derivatives interact with um, algebra. So that's, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm reinforcing this notation stuff before we talk about combinations of derivatives, um, because it's useful. I'll hold here in case anybody is still writing, um, but this is all I, I want to say on this. <clears throat> All right, turning the page in about five seconds. Okay. So last time, last time we learned the power rule. And in the prime notation, what the power rule says is, if f of x is x raised to any power is a power function, focus, then f primed of x can be calculated by bringing the power down and then reducing the power of x by one. This is the power rule. I had a quick question about that. Yeah. It was talking about the power rule, but on a derivative where there's an x on the top and an x on the bottom of the bracket. Yeah, so those, the only things we can apply this rule to are straight up powers of x. 
So if you have a fraction with x's upstairs and x's downstairs, then you'll need to combine those into a single power function before you can apply this rule. We can't like apply this rule to the top and apply this rule to the bottom separately. That doesn't work. Um, I will give you a rule for differentiating fractions today, um, but your first thought should be, can I write those as a single power? If you can, then you can apply this rule. And that's great, that's easy. It's much easier than the rule I'm gonna show you for fractions today. Um, but if you can't, then you will need some other rule. So let me first, I wanted to say uh, in the differential operator notation, which is sometimes called Leibniz notation, L-E-I-B-N-I-T-Z, uh, maybe no T, I think, just Z. Um, this is Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, one of the discoverers of calculus. Uh, this can be written really nicely as ddx of x to the p equals p x to the p minus one. Right, I never have to give the thing a name. I never have to call it f of x. Um, I can just say what the derivative of a power function is. And that, that, that notation is kind of nice because it doesn't require I name every single piece that I'm playing with. So this statement is exactly the same as this statement. It just says that the derivative of a power function can be taken by pouring the power down and reducing the power by one. So before I move on to some examples, Robert, and I will look at some examples of the type that you're talking about today, I want to um, show you how to get new derivatives from old derivatives. So combining derivatives algebraically. Um, this is a theorem. Just like our power rule is a theorem, I'm, I'm not labeling the power rule as a theorem here because that, you know we did that yesterday. Operator, yeah, the word here, operator, sorry. O-P-E-R-A-T-O-R. Uh, All right, so the theorem on combinations of derivatives. I'm gonna write this in terms of the Leibniz notation says that ddx of a constant times f of x is the same as that constant times the derivative of f of x. So constant multiples pop out. And of course, you could write this as c times f prime of x if you want. So constant multiples pop out. And ddx of a sum or difference of two functions is the sum or difference of the derivatives. That's ddx of f of x plus or minus ddx of g of x. Um, or in the prime notation, that's f prime of x plus or minus g prime of x. This is the idea. So if you want to take the derivative of a constant multiple of a function, just pop out the constant, right? The constant just comes along for the ride. And if you want to take a derivative of a sum or difference of functions, um, just take the derivative of each piece and then add those up. Um, so this is these things together say that the derivative is a linear operator. And to anybody with an interest in quantum mechanics um, or any sort of high level physics, um, operator theory, specifically the theory of linear operators is very, very important. So this theorem is your friend. <clears throat> This theorem, together with the power rule, is what will allow us to differentiate polynomials. Um, so let's look at an example. 
let's find f primed of x, where f of x is equal to 3x to the 7 minus 2x cubed uh, plus 5x. Uh, I'll add a 1 here. Why not? <clears throat> plus 1. Um, so something else we talked about yesterday that I haven't said explicitly here, the derivative of the constant, remember, what was that? Zero. Yeah, good, okay. So F primed here, that's what you get when you apply the differential operator ddx to F of x. So this is what we get when we apply the differential operator ddx to three x to the seven minus two x cubed plus five x plus one. And I can take the derivative of each of these pieces on their own. This is ddx of three x to the seven minus ddx of two x cubed plus ddx of five x plus ddx of one. And this is all well and good. Now I know that the constant multiples here can pop out. So this three is gonna come out, this two is gonna come out, and this five is gonna come out. The derivative of one is zero. So this will be three times ddx of x to the seven minus two times ddx of x cubed plus five times ddx of x plus the derivative of one or any constant is zero. And then finally, each of these derivatives is easy to calculate using the power rule. ddx of x to the seven is seven x to the six. And then I found minus two times ddx of x cubed is three x squared plus five times ddx of x. What's ddx of x? Well, that would be one. Yeah, good, that's one times x to the zero. All right, the pattern still holds. You bring the, the old power down, which was one, and you reduce the power by one, but x to the zero is just one. So at the end of the day here, we're gonna get 21 x to the six minus six x squared plus five <clears throat> times x to the zero is just five times one or five. This is our derivative here, not a, not a difficult thing to calculate. Uh, and you can see right away how you would calculate the derivative of any polynomial, right? It's just the exact same stuff. You just split it up, pop out the constants, differentiate each little power of x according to the power rule. Any questions on this? Okay. I'd like to look next at something along the lines of what Robert was talking about. I'm gonna do this through a few examples. We'll slowly build. And we're gonna practice with the alternate notations. Let's find ddx of two square root x plus one over x. Certainly, according to my rules, I can split this up as ddx of two square root x plus ddx of one over x, right? That's splitting up over addition, this is fine. But I don't immediately see how to take the derivative of either of those pieces. Neither of them looks like x to the p, at least not right away. But if we think about it for a minute, think about our algebra skills, and this is algebra imperative at every step of calculus. This is the same as 2x to the 1 half. 
right? Because the square root of x is the same as x to the one half plus ddx of x to the negative one, because one over x is the same as x to the negative one. Unfortunately, I cannot like just push the ddx inside the square root. I cannot just push the ddx downstairs here. That doesn't work. Ddx plays nice with addition and subtraction, but it does not play nice with multiplication, division, or powers. But now with, with these rewritten in this way, I know exactly what to do. Well, here's x to the p, right? p is just one half. It's just not a whole number. Here's x to the p. p just happens to be negative one. So the two is going to pop out of this first guy, and I'll have ddx of x to the one half. I'll calculate that using my power rule. Over here, I'll just leave this guy in this step. It's nice to kind of, you know, do one thing at a time. So now I'm ready to take my derivatives. I popped the two out. He's just going to come along for the ride. He is a constant multiple. And ddx of x to the one half is going to be one half x to the one half minus one. And my advice here, put this in parens. All right, don't, don't risk confusing yourself. Especially if this was like a negative, you don't want to find yourself subtracting these. They're multiplying. So make sure that, that your notation is evocative of multiplication. Similarly, over here, the derivative of x to the negative one is negative one times x to the negative one minus one. Two times one half is one. So these are going to cancel. One half minus one is negative one half. Plus negative one times something, that's the same thing as subtracting. And then negative one minus one is negative two. This is x to the negative two. Um, now, this at this stage, you could say I'm done, right? You could. It wouldn't be incorrect to do that. This, this is indeed the correct derivative. But it's nice to give the answer in the same sort of notation that the problem was given. So x to the negative 1 half, that's 1 over x to the 1 half minus x to the negative 2, that's 1 over x to the 2. Uh, and then this x to the 1 half, that's a square root of x. So this is 1 over the square root of x minus one over x squared. And this is how I would, I, would, I would give the answer if I was working the problem. This is the nicest way. Would you mark off points if we didn't? No, I wouldn't. You could stop here. All right, yeah, this, this is an acceptable place to stop. Um, but, you know, sometimes we want to go on and do something further with the derivative. Oftentimes we want to like set the derivative equal to zero or solve some inequalities involving the derivative. Um, and for those purposes, simplification is important. But yeah, if on the test I said just calculate this derivative and on that test you gave me this answer with correct work in between, I would give full credit, no, no doubt. No I have a question about so on the test when we do our work, do we just take a picture and send it to you after? Sort of. Yeah, you're gonna take a picture, really you're gonna scan using a an app like Cam Scanner, something that produces a PDF. You're gonna scan your work and then submit it to a Canvas assignment. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. We're getting close to exam one. So Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, I'll give some real clear examples. But after you finish the test, you're going to scan all of your work and then um, submit it. Uh, yeah, Holly, that's correct. So the square root is the same as a one half power. That's the idea. So remember, remember how loops work. So if you have the uh, x to the a over b, this is the same thing as the b root of x to the a, which is the same thing as, oh, my pen is dying, the b root of x fuck me, b root of x 
all raised to the A. All right, so, uh, so in particular, the square root is the same as the one half power. X to the one half is the same thing as the second root of X to the one, which is just the square root of X. In general, the nth root of x is x to the 1 over n. It's a fact we'll use a lot. Other questions on these so far? Yeah, no problem. So I would like to address Robert's question next. Robert, at the at the start of this little discussion, um, said, "You know, what if I have a fraction, and top and bottom I have some x's? How do I handle that?" <clears throat> I'm gonna pull away this page in about five seconds. If you need a screenshot or something, grab it now. Okay. So here is a fraction, and the top and bottom have lots of x's. I cannot apply my power rule to this directly. This is not a power function. All right, in my parentheses here is definitely not just like x to the 5. Uh, this is more complicated. But I can split this up. <clears throat> into individual little fractions, three of them. This over this, this over this, and this over this. And then I can simplify each one of those fractions, and then I can apply the power rule to each one of those pieces. So here's how you do something like this. And I think maybe while this, this is perhaps more complicated than you were asking about, Robert, um, each one of these little pieces <clears throat> will, will look like what you, I think you were asking about. So I can split this up. This is just algebra. The rule I'm using here is a rule for adding fractions. Um, just says that, you know, if you have a plus B over C, that's the same as A over C plus B over C. This is the rule being used. And I'm using it three times. I'm saying you can split a fraction up over its numerator. So you take the first part of the numerator over the bottom, plus the second part of the numerator over the bottom, plus the third part of the numerator over the bottom. You can split all these up. If you were to add all these together, since they have the same denominator, you would just get one fraction with with this denominator and all of the tops added up. This is going backwards in adding fractions with a common denominator, that's all. Now I can give my derivative to each piece. So I have ddx of x squared over x root x. Plus I can pop out this constant multiple to ddx of x over x root x minus 5 ddx of root x over x root x. So I split up the fraction, and then I sort of distribute the ddx. <clears throat> I give the ddx to each piece. And as I do that, I pop out the constant multiples. So I think. If I was hearing you right, Robert, the sort of thing you're asking about was stuff like this, where I've got a, a derivative of a fraction and there's a power of x upstairs and a power of x downstairs. Yeah, I'll 
and I'll do one of the questions on the homework, and it was like 10x over the square root 9 minus x. And I couldn't really figure out where to go. So I think that if I'm hearing it right, it sounds like we might need we might need something else for that. I'm going to show you guys the something else that you'll need for that. Okay. Um, that kind of sounds like a quotient rule problem, and that's the less that's going to be the the last thing we do today. Um, but to handle this guy, I can just simplify each of these pieces into a power function. So we have to remember our rules for exponents. The top here, this is x to the two. And downstairs here, this is x to the one times x to the one half. That's x to the three halves. So I'm still just doing algebra, still not doing any calculus yet. This is x to the one over x to the three halves minus five times dbx, x to the one half over x to the three halves. And now each of these I can write as a straight up power just using the rules. x to the a over x to the b is x to the a minus b. So this first piece, still no calculus, just algebra, is x to the 2 minus 3 halves. Well, 2 is 4 halves. 4 halves minus 3 halves is 1 half. Plus x to the 1 minus 3 halves. So here I'll have 2 ddx, x to the 1 minus 3 halves. Well, that's negative one half, right? One is two halves. Two halves minus three halves is negative one half. And then minus five ddx. X to the one half minus three halves. Well, one half minus three halves is negative two halves. That's x to the negative one. So it's still all just been algebra. The square root is x to the one half. So what I have in this denominator is x to the 1 half times x to the 1. x root x is x to the 1 times x to the 1 half, which is x to the 3 halves. I'm using the partner of this rule here, which is x to the a times x to the b is x to the a plus b. So that bottom x root x, right? x times the square root of x, that is x to the 3 halves. Yeah, so like this piece on its own is x to the 1 half. This is x to the 1. x to the 1 times x to the 1 half is x to the 1.5, or x to the 3 halves. Now we're ready to dive in. So this first piece is going to be 1 half x to the one half minus one. The second piece is going to be two times negative one half x to the negative one half minus one. And the third piece will be minus five times negative one x to the negative one minus one. So that's one half x to the negative uh, one half, right? One half minus one is negative one half. And then here, the two and the negative one half can cancel. I'll get minus x to the negative one half minus one is negative three halves. And then negative five times negative one, that's going to be plus five times x to the negative two. And again, we could rewrite these uh, a little bit more nicely without any weird powers. Um, this is one half times one over the square root of x. minus one over x to the three halves plus five times one over x squared. Uh, and if you want to, you can go a little further. This is one over two square roots of x minus one over the square root of x cubed plus five over x squared. If you really feel like it, you could even have a common denominator and put these back into a single fraction. I don't think that's worth doing.
So we're going to get real comfy with working with fractions. All right, we're going to get real comfy working with fractions as powers, working with negative powers, all this good stuff. Um, which brings me to the two new rules we need to learn, um, or at least I, I want to introduce today. Um, those two new rules are called the product rule and the quotient rule. Um, before we get to those, I guess I should, we still need to go over the exponential stuff. So yeah, let's do that. Uh, any questions on this example before we move on? Okay, guys, didn't know what you're going to do. Okay, so let's I want to tell you something. Down the road, we are going to have a rule for differentiating fractions, right? Like f over g. How do you differentiate something that can be written as f of x over g of x? You should always try to do this first. Here, I'm writing out every single possible step. But in reality, you could, you could jump pretty much from like here to here, and then from here to here, and then from there to here. This could be like a three-line problem, you know, if we weren't being so very careful about writing everything. Doing things this way by like simplifying using algebra and then taking the derivative is always much faster than using any other complicated differentiation rules, like the quotient rule or product rule that we're going to learn today. Um, so every time you encounter something that looks difficult to differentiate, uh, you should see if you can simplify it algebraically before doing anything else. Yeah, Luke asks a good, a good question. On the test, what do I require you to write? I require you to write enough to show me that you know what you're doing. Um, so I need enough on the page that I can follow your work. Um, so like I said, a kind of minimal solution here would look like this, followed by this, followed by this, right? Um, I need enough on the page to know that you're not just like looking up an answer and writing it down. I know that there are, there are plenty of websites that will produce steps too. And don't think for a second that I don't know what those look like. Okay. I run my own shit through PhotoMath. I run my own shit through Wolfram. So I know what the steps are that come out of those things. Don't try to copy that shit down. I'm hip to that. Um, but I need enough on the page to show me that you did the calculation. Uh, so that, that's, that's all. You'll get a feel for it as you go through these things. Whatever you need to write down in order to do the calculation is what I want to see. Other questions on this? I will work lots of more examples. And as we work more and more examples, I will not continue to be this verbose. Um, I'm just doing this because it's one of the first, first times we've done it. So moving on. Depending on who you took pre-calculus or college algebra with, um, you have seen, at least I hope, the, the number e. Um, the definition of the number e that is most common is the limit as n goes to infinity in 1 plus 1 over n to the n, i.e., that is, the number e is equal to limit n to infinity, 1 plus 1 over n to the n. You saw something like this in one of your homeworks on limits at infinity, uh, where you had to, you know, use it said use a calculator to approximate some limit that looked like this. The inside was going to one, the power was going to infinity, and you know it asked you to use a calculator to give the first few decimals of the value of that limit. Um, something that's fun here, if you take your phone number and plug it in for n, I don't, I'm not gonna do this because I don't wanna put my cell phone number out here, but uh, if you take your phone number, any large number and plug it in for n here, you'll find that you get something that is uh, very, very close to 2.71828, blah, blah, blah. 
So this is the number E that we all meet back in college algebra usually, or maybe a pre-calculus class in high school, it depends. But this is the standard definition. Wait, is that one over N? Yes. Okay. So this is one plus one over N, all being raised to the power of N. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Um, I can show you in Desmos if you want. If you want it. <laughs> I'll use the variable x because Desmos will get less confused. <clears throat> Looks a little bit weird over there to the left, but if you zoom way out to the right, you'll see this thing sneaking up on the line y equals e. So as, as x goes to infinity, x uh, one plus one over x all raised to the power of x gets closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to this number e, which is like 2.7182, blah, blah, blah. So this is the def most of us are familiar with. Your textbook definition, the alternate definition, is that the number e is the unique real number satisfying lim h to zero e to the h minus one all over h equals one. So it turns out these definitions are equivalent. If you replace h by one over n, you can turn the second definition into the first. Um, so a fun exercise. Substitute one over n for h. Note that as h goes to zero and goes to infinity and prove that these definitions are equivalent. It's not that hard. Um, <clears throat> just kind of work with this definition. I'll show you a hint. So if H is equal to one over N, then e to the h minus one all divided by h is the same as e to the one over n minus one all divided by one over n. And if this is supposed to be pretty close to one, then you can multiply both sides by one over n and you get n is pretty close to e to the one over n minus one and then you can add one to both sides. Uh, let me see, did I proof something up here? Multiply both sides by. Oh, I'm sorry, multiply both sides by one over n. Yeah, 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 sorry. Um, so you get one over n is equal to that. And then you add one, you get one plus one over n is equal to e to the one over n approximately equal to. Uh, and then raise both sides to the nth power. One plus one over n to the n is approximately equal to e. All right, this is the idea. Uh, and if you wanna make this more rigorous, then you'd, you'd have to insert some limits and be a little bit careful. I'm using this shaky equal signs to say this is, this is pretty much true, um, as long as n is big. For large values of n. That's the idea. Um, so you get here the old definition, from here the new definition. Um, <clears throat> point being, this number e is the same as this number e. So the e we're going to work with in this class is the same e that you've seen in your previous algebra classes. This definition happens to be a little bit more useful when it comes to calculating derivatives of e to the x, and I'll show you why. 
Um, if this little bit about showing the definitions are equivalent doesn't feel good to you, feels weird, feels shaky, feels hard, feels scary, um, don't panic. It's not the sort of thing that I'm going to require you guys to do. I just thought you might be curious to see why the fuck are we using this definition instead of this definition, and are they really the same thing? They are. They really are the same thing. And the trick is to just substitute 1 over n in for h. But the reason we do this, turning the page in about five seconds, the reason we use this definition in, in calc class is because we want to calculate the derivative of e to the x. And that derivative ends up having that definition as a factor. So the derivative of f of x equals e to the x. Let's do it. is f primed of x, well, it's always the limit as h goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, which for this function is the limit as h goes to 0, e raised to the power of x plus h, because f of x is e to the x, f of dog shit is e to the dog shit, f of x plus h is e to the x plus h minus f of x, which is e to the x, all divided by h. Now, remember that rule for exponents that I had written down over here just a second ago? a to the x times a to the y is a to the x plus y. You can use this backwards to say something like this is the same as something like this. So in particular, e to the x plus h of lim h to 0. e to the x plus h is e to the x times e to the h. And then over here, I still have my minus e to the x. And downstairs, I still have h. And you notice upstairs, there's a common factor of e to the x between these two terms. So I can factor e to the x out. And what's left is e to the h minus 1. Upstairs, I factored out an e to the x. Right? If you redistribute this e to the x, you will get exactly this. So what do we have here? I have lim h to 0. I'm just going to peel this e to the x off. e to the h minus 1 over h times e to the x. We can do that. This is, this is valid algebra. e to the x is e to the x over 1. When you multiply e to the x over 1 times this fraction, you get this fraction. This piece, by definition, is 1. Right? That's the definition of e in our calculus book. It's the unique real number such that this limit comes up to 1. So this whole thing here is just e to the x. So if f of x is e to the x, then f primed is e to the x. In other words, when you differentiate e to the x, you don't change. i.e. in Leibniz notation, ddx of e to the x is e to the x. This is a big deal. So I'll give you a second here. Questions on this? So e to the h minus 1 over h is always 1? As h goes to 0. Yeah, the limit as h goes to 0 of e to the h minus 1 over h, that is 1. Okay. Without this limit, that wouldn't be 1. 
But as you send h towards zero, this thing goes to one. Is this a rule or is it just specific to e to the um, x? It's a definition that is unique to the number e. OK. In general, if you really want to know, I can tell you the, the bigger the big boy rule here that's hiding in the background. Um, don't write this down if, if, if you think there's risk of it adding confusion. But in general, the limit as h goes to 0 of b to the h minus 1 over h, this is actually the natural log of b. This is one way to define the natural log of b. Uh, so for e, you get the natural log of e, which is 1. That's, that's one way of thinking about this. But your textbook just defines the number e as the unique number satisfying this limit equals 1. But is it just like whenever it's e to the h minus 1 over h, or is it like whenever it's just e to the h in the mix? But it's equal to 1. I don't understand. Like, for example, let's say it was just e to the h over h. Would it be 1? Like the uh, limit? Well, without a limit, no, that's just e to the h over h. No, 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 with the limit, with the limit. Uh, if you were sending h to 0, then e to the h over h would not go to 1. No. Um, that would that would go to infinity actually because the top would go to one and the bottom would go to zero right e to the zero is one so the top would be one and h as h goes to zero is zero so without this one here without this minus one up here no it doesn't does not come out to one okay what if it was like minus two <laughs> then something else. If that was minus two, then you could split that up as minus one, minus one, group the terms like this. That term would be one, and then you'd have a minus one over h. And as h goes to zero, minus one over h again blows up. So this this and only this limit here um, is, is how we define the number e. Okay. The idea is think, think about if you tried to plug in h equals zero. e to the zero is one, right? So the top is 1 minus 1, which is 0. And if you plug in 0 downstairs, you get 0. So this looks like 0 over 0. This is weird. If you change the top so that the top wasn't going to 0, this would no longer be weird. Um, there would be no question about what the limit is. The only time there's any doubt about limits like these is when the top and bottom are both going to 0. So this definition is trying to help us out of the weird position that this limit looks like zero over zero because I cannot factor in h, right? Most of the time when we calculate derivatives like this, we end up factoring out and canceling the h from downstairs. And that's how we get those limits, right? Like maybe you multiply by the conjugate or you expand something, but then you combine like terms, factor out and cancel the h. Here, I cannot cancel the h from the downstairs. So this definition is kind of a cheeky way to get around that. They say, oh, okay, well, we would never be able to calculate this limit barehanded. So what we're going to do is we're going to define the number e to be the unique real number such that this limit goes to 1. And it just happens to be the case that that number e is the same as the number e you met in the previous algebra class. So again, if this, if this isn't feeling copacetic, if you're having a hard time digesting this, don't panic. That's all right. The most important thing for you to remember is that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Remember that, work with it, and then if you want to understand it more deeply, consider coming back and cooking this up yourself. Um, it's not bad. It's in the textbook. There's also lots of videos online. Um, so if you want to talk more about this, we can do it in office hours. But for now, I want to get us some practice calculating derivatives. Other questions on this before we, before we move away? I have a question. Yeah. So say it's the limit of as h goes to zero of like three to the h minus one over h. So it'd just be the natural log of three? Yep. Okay. Officially, we don't know that yet, but unofficially, I'm telling you, yeah, that's this is actually one way to define the natural log function. All right. I'll show you how to cook that up later, but we'll need something called a chain rule. Okay.
Let's see if we can find this derivative. At a glance, it looks kind of scary. Upstairs here, I have an x times e to the x. I have no idea how to take the derivative of that. Um, and downstairs here, I have an x. This big fraction is a little scary. But like we did in the last one, we can split it up using algebra first. So this is x e to the x over x minus 2 over x, which is d dx of cancel the x's. And you just get e to the x. And then over here, you rewrite this as 2 times x to the negative 1. Now you can split it up as d dx of e to the x minus 2 times d dx of x to the negative 1. The derivative d dx of e to the x, what is this piece? e to the x. Good. e to the x is its own derivative. That what, that's really what makes this function special. That's why mathematicians have such a hard on for e to the x. It is its own derivative. That's a really big deal. And then over here, I have minus 2 times the derivative of x to the negative 1 which is negative one times x to the negative two. And then we should clean this up a little bit. This is e to the x plus two times one over x squared. So again, the algebra saving the day. I cannot differentiate this and this separately. That doesn't work because they're being multiplied. In fact, what I'd like to get at here is uh, what I'd like to get at next here is, is this um, big question. How could I differentiate something like ddx x e to the x on its own? If I don't have an x to cancel, what can I do with that piece? Could you not do anything? Well, that's that's sort of the question, yeah. Um, so the, our first thoughts may be, maybe I take d dx of x and I multiply that by d dx of e to the x which would be just one times e to the x. But if I apply that same logic, that would say that the derivative d dx of 5x would be d dx of 5 times d dx of x, which would be 0 times 1, which would be 0. But we know that d dx of 5x is just 5. So this logic must be bad. Wait, would the first logic be bad or the second logic? They are the same logic. So we're thinking maybe this sort of thing works. Maybe you can take the derivative of a product by just differentiating each piece and then multiplying them. But if that's how this worked, then this would have to work like this. But we know this isn't true. We know that the derivative of 5x should be 5, not 0. So the logic we used here, which is the same as the logic we used here, must be wrong. Oh, uh, you just put another constant other than one in front of x. Is that how you showed that it, that thought was wrong? Yeah, well, so this one, yeah, the five would pop out and then the derivative d dx of x would be one, right? We can, here, I'll, I'll write it all out. This would be five times d dx of x and then d dx of x is one. So this is five times one, which is five. 
Um, so the question is like, if this is wrong and this is doing the same thing as this, then this must be wrong. We know this is wrong because the right way to differentiate 5x is this. So this guy and this guy are using the same logic. I know that this one is wrong, which means this one must also be wrong. So then what's, oh, never mind, never mind. Oh, then what's d, 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 d dx of x times e to the that's yeah that's the burning question right so what the hell is the derivative of x times e to the x how do we differentiate more generally so what we're showing here what we've just shown so while one one might hope that ddx of f of x times g of x is f primed of x times g primed of x. But we've just shown that this doesn't work. So what does? what well, does work? That's the burning question. And the answer is a little bit more complicated, but there is a good answer here. It's called the product rule. This says that if you want to take a derivative of a product, f of x times g of x, the way you do this is by differentiating the first function, multiplying by the second, and then leaving the first function alone and multiplying by the derivative of the second. The way this is normally written is f primed times g plus f times g primed. This is the correct way to differentiate a product, and it will be consistent with all of our past results, and it will allow us to extend into new stuff like x times e to the x. Let's see if this works. All right. So here's the theorem. Right. This is the this is the big boy theorem for differentiating products. Is that a plus sign? Between, yes. Yeah. yeah, in between these is a plus. So you differentiate the pieces one at a time. That's how you differentiate a product. You differentiate the pieces like one piece at a time and you add that up. So if your product is f times g, you differentiate the f and you leave g alone. Then you add that to what you get when you leave f alone and differentiate g. Right, each one of these guys has one of the functions differentiated and the other one left alone. We can check that this works for simple stuff like ddx of 5x. Here, f of x is the constant function 5, and g of x is the function x. So this should be d dx of 5 times x plus 5 times d dx of x, according to the product rule. d dx of 5, the derivative of the constant here is 0. So this would be 0 times x plus 5 times d dx of x is 1. So this tells me I get 0x plus 5, which is 5. And we know that, yeah, the derivative of 5x should be 5. So this one, unlike the thing we guessed at first, doesn't fuck up on the things we know how to do. But now the good news. Let 
what about ddx of x e to the x? So again, f of x is here, g of x is here. This should be the derivative of the first times the second left alone, plus the first times the derivative of the second. ddx of x, that's one. So this is one times e to the x plus x times ddx of e to the x. Well, ddx of e to the x is e to the x. So that's your derivative of x e to the x. It's e to the x plus x e to the x. Neat stuff, right? <clears throat> it's a little counterintuitive, um, but the proof isn't that bad. I'm not certainly not going to require you guys to go through the proof, um, but if you're wondering why this works, I encourage you to check it out. Um, I could show you, but it would take longer for me to write than it would for me to. Yeah. Help on. We'll go here. This is fine. Modules. Different class. That's all right. Those same modules here. False notes. Differentiation rules. So you'll see here proofs of the product and quotient rule, proofs of all the rules that we use. Um, in particular, some difference, constant, multiples, power rule. Here's your proof of the product rule. I know this looks a little bit scary, but if you take your time reading this, you'll find it's, it's really not scary. We just start by writing down the definition of the derivative. And then he does this little trick where you add and subtract this term. And then you regroup the pieces and you'll see that you really do get this piece, which is f of x times this piece, which is g prime, plus this piece, which is g of x times this piece, which is f prime. And that's the rule. So I invite you to read this if you wanna see where it comes from. I don't wanna burn class time on it. I'm not gonna hold you guys responsible for the proofs, but you do need to know the rule. So up here, it's your product rule. You got to know it. Um, this is the Leibniz notation. If you want in prime notation, it looks like like this, right? So the prime really is the same as ddx. Could you just move the page down for a second? I didn't finish writing that. Sure, oh, of course. Problem. Thank you so much. Yeah, happy to. All right, I'll hold here for about 10 seconds. So let's get a little more practice with the product rule. I want to highlight some things that you can use the product rule on and some things you might, might not want to use the product rule on. So find the derivative of, uh, find the derivative, I'll just say it like this, ddx of x squared plus two times x minus three. So I could use the product rule. Um, 
right? Like I can think of this as f of x and this as g of x. So ddx of x squared plus 2 times x minus 3. I could write this as, I'm going to use some, some prime notation here in a way that, that I think is really useful. It's, I differentiate the first one. So x squared plus 2 prime, leave the other alone. And then I add that to what I get when I leave the first one alone. And I differentiate the second one. And this sort of schematic, writing things out in the prime notation like this, for sure, the best way to calculate product rule, quotient rule, all sorts of derivatives like that. Now, the derivative of x squared plus 2, the x squared will differentiate to 2x, and the 2 there will differentiate to 0. So that's 2x plus 0 times x minus 3 plus x squared plus 2 times the derivative of x minus 3 is 1 minus 0. So this is 2x times x minus 3 plus x squared plus 2 times 1. And we can distribute combined like terms. This is 2x squared minus 6x plus x squared plus 2. So I've got 3x squared all together minus 6x and plus 2. This works. Is this the best way to do this, though? Could I have done this without the product rule? You could have multiplied through. Yeah, I could have foiled these out and then just differentiated using the power rule. And that would be much faster. Let's see how that goes. So x squared plus 2 times x minus 3. My firsts are x cubed. My outers are minus 3x squared. My inners are plus 2x. And my lasts are minus 6. All right, so this is, I guess I should write up here, ddx of x squared plus 2 times x minus 3 equals this equals now I just differentiate each piece on its own this is 3x squared minus 6x plus 2 minus 0 which is my answer 3x squared minus 6x plus 2 I know what I would rather do I would much rather do the bottom. And the message from this example is you shouldn't use the product rule unless you need to. We get the same thing, notice, right? You get the same answer, and we sure shit better because this function only has one derivative. And if you, no matter how you calculate it, it's going to come out the same. But when you set up the product rule like this, there's so many places where you can make a mistake. Here, you, you just have to foil things out and then use your power rule. It's so easy. So I would much rather do this than this. And I encourage you to do the same. Now, there are some problems in your homework that ask you to calculate them both ways. And that's fine. It's good practice. And you get an idea that, that this is generally faster than this. That's what is the time yeah. where, you can, where you can only use the product rule besides x times e to the x. So anytime you had a polynomial times an exponential, like you know x squared plus 7 times e to the x, that sort of shit requires the product rule. We haven't talked about derivatives of trig functions yet, but we're getting there. Um, and if you have you know, an exponential times a trig, or a polynomial times a trig, or a square root times a trig, or exponential, anything like that, um, if you cannot combine the functions into a, 
a polynomial or a sum of power functions, then you must use the product rule. And we'll see lots of examples like that. All right. If there's a product rule, you can guess that there's a quotient rule. We're not gonna have time to go all the way through this right now. because we are just about out of time for class, but I'm gonna end with this question. What about derivatives of fractions? dx of f of x over g of x. Um, I'll tell you that this is not f primed of x over g primed of x. And you can check this. This fails. Similarly to our product rule guess from earlier. Uh, you can try differentiating ddx something simple like five over x. This certainly is not the derivative of five divided by the derivative of x because the derivative of five is zero and the derivative of x is one, zero over one would be zero. We know that ddx of five over x should be five times ddx of one over x. Constant multiples pop out, which is five times ddx of x to the negative one, which is five times negative one x to the negative two, or negative five over x squared. So whatever's going on here with fractions, something involving the square of the bottom, right? The top here, Five became negative five. I don't know what's going on with that, but the bottom went from an x to an x squared. So whatever formula is correct for the derivative ddx of a fraction, f of x over g of x, should involve the square of the bottom being downstairs. And it does. So next time I will show you guys the quotient rule. Right, next time we will go through that. Um, similarly to how we went through the product rule today, and then we'll be done with all the material for this week. Uh, we are imparting here. We are getting close to our first test. Um, so our first test was originally planned to be in the uh, first week of February, and we're about on track for that. Um, we've got our basic differentiation rules here. I haven't included any trig derivatives in your homework for this week because I don't want to overwhelm. Um, but at the end of the week, after introducing the quotient rule on Friday, I'll start to get us thinking about trig derivatives. And then at the start of next week, um, we will do trig derivatives and the chain rule. Um, and then at the end of next week, I will, um, I will probably release your study guide for exam one. So probably exam one will not be next week. Where are we at here? Yeah, probably exam one will not be next week, but the week after. Um, and towards the end of next week, either Wednesday or Friday of next week, I will release your first study guide. And we'll also talk about exactly how the exam is going to be done. Uh, remember, you're going to need to have honor lock, so you're going to make sure you have the Chrome browser installed on your computer and is up to date. You're also going to need to be running Zoom on your phones, um, and we're going to be using those phones to show me your desk, your hands, your writing, and all of that as you go. We'll talk more about that as, as the exam gets closer. Uh, next time, again, quotient rule, and then we're going to start on derivatives of trig functions. Any questions before I let you guys go for the day? Alrighty, then I'm gonna go ahead and sign out here on the meeting. Hope you guys have a lovely rest of your day. And if you do have any questions, you wanna come by an office hour or anything like that, feel free to do so. I do have an office hour today from one to 2 p.m. Uh, take care, guys. Thank you.